Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, in the Sarasota Center of Light. I feel honored and privileged to be here again and speak before you. And uh, let me begin with what you can see right in front of you if you take the handout into your hands. You can see two pages. One is about the Zen circle, and the other is about mind and karma. You will need them. And the reason is that we'll talk about human beings and this earth. This earth is something very clear. We have trees, rivers, mountains, wildlife, nature. It's not difficult to find nature. I've just been to the mangrove tunnels and they are fascinating. It's amazing what you guys have here in Sarasota. So when you look for nature outside, it's not difficult to find it. And somehow when you're in the forest or at the sea, you can feel nature. That's why we yearn back to nature. That's why we go back to take kayak rides and walks and whitewater rafting and tours in the Grand Canyon. So we want nature, but do we know why? Do we know what we really want from nature? And if you look deep enough, when you dare to go silent in nature, you find something unspoken inside, as if you, something in you, and nature could become one. And for that oneness experience, we return to nature from time to time. Humanity, all the 7.8 billion of us, we are living in a highly urbanized and technicized society with an unprecedented amount of infrastructure, which we need, doubtless. But should that be to the detriment of this nature around us, to the detriment of the planet around us? And you can see that those people who are isolated from nature, living only in very urbanized, isolated societies, they don't feel so well. They're not so happy. Crime rates go up. Dissatisfaction goes up. Because we are separated from nature. And ultimately, if you don't pay attention, you are separated from our true nature, too. Why did the Taoist hermits go up to the mountains and stay there for decades? Why did Zen monks go up to the mountains and stay there for decades? Because when we meditate and we shut down our perpetual thinking and take away the energy from all our karma, we can return to the state of oneness. We can become one again. We can become clear again. And nature, with its spontaneous and intelligent function, helps us do that. You can see two very important schematics. One is the Zen circle. That's about our path. That's the kind of life and death we have on this earth. And the other one is the mind only and karma. It's about who we are better who we think we are, but we, in fact, are not. And as always, talking about an object is easier than talking about the subjects. Talking about our path, what we want to do, what we have to do, what we must not do, is always easier. So let us begin with the Zen circle. You can see five distinct points there. Zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees and 360 degrees. And there are some phrases and explanations for you to remember what I'm about to say. Zero degrees is the usual dust, the usual clinging, the habitual attachment that we all have and get started with. When we become adults, we have this very strong notion of I and the natural self-centeredness with which we approach life and our relationships. If you are too self-centered, we suffer. If you totally lose yourself in the everyday world, others make you suffer. You're too weak, it's a problem. Too strong, also a problem. But zero degrees is not asking questions. That's how you know that it's zero. Because everybody else is wrong and only I am right. That's zero degrees. The world has a problem. I have only demands to be fulfilled. That is zero degrees. You fix your problem. 
I'm not about to help you. You're on your own. That's zero degrees. For zero degrees minds, the world is just a place where you can satisfy your desires and vent your anger and nothing and no one else matters, only the self, only the ego, only the notion of that particular individual. Of course, that can change because eventually most people will have a significant other. But if one zero degrees meets another zero degrees, then it remains zero, sometimes even worse. And you can see families grow up like that, that they reproduce in their offsprings the same mindset, the same super strong attachment to the notion of their egos and shoot first and not even ask questions later. Just keep shooting. That's zero degrees. And then when you first ask a legitimate question, which actually refers to how we are functioning on this planet as human beings, what our job is on this planet, what we can do beyond just self-sustenance on this planet, then you're asking your first question and you are at one degree and you start to study. We have an intellect. It's wonderful. Use it. Use it to study. So we have a strong IQ. And also use your EQ to feel what's going on, not just in you, but also in your surroundings, in your environment. Study that. And when you keep studying, you begin to perceive cause and effect. The Buddha, Shakyamuni himself, in the Dhammapada, he said, if this exists, that also exists. If this ceases to exist, that also ceases to exist. He referred to dualistic pairs in the universe. And in this world, as you can see, everything exists in pairs, in dualistic qualities, attracting each other. So studies can give you an intellectual insight into cause and effect. And that's why we have libraries, that's why you have study groups, and also that's why we have communities, congregations, and sanghas. But as you get very clever and less self-centered, and you begin to understand another person, your surroundings, the way this world operates, including you, you realize that without experience, studies become empty and meaningless after a while. That's when you get sick of the library because you read so much, you know so much, but you haven't experienced sufficiently your path. You haven't attained your true nature. You realize that you can read the user's manual in 10,000 languages, but if you do not use the device, if you do not have direct experience, suddenly it feels useless. In China there's a saying, you read one book, you have to take 10,000 steps. This is very true, and when people realize that, they go to 91 degrees and stop being attached to thinking. 91, 92, 93, etc., we begin to experience something more than just the intellect. Something more than just IQ and EQ. And then, as we progress on our path, we can attain something which is our true nature our true substance, which originally has no name, no form, no life, no death, no dualistic qualities or attributes whatsoever. That's when we get to 180 degrees. And between 90 and 180, there are so, so many steps, so many paths you can take, so many studies you can complete. But when you actually get to the point of oneness, when you and the world become one, then there is no thinking, no concepts, no I, no good, no bad, only this. When you hear the sound, for one second there was no thinking in your mind. When all thinking is cut off, you stop your narrative, you stop generating your notion of self, and for that moment, you and the world became one. And if you meditate, if you practice correctly, you, you will not need the stick, and you will not need to hear the hit to sustain and use that experience. 
Our substance is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And if you use that, you can perceive the truth, including your karma, another person's karma, your family karma, and your group karma. We have these four major types. And you better look at them very, very clearly and see every one of them for what they are. Your individual karma, what is that? Your dual karma, when you have a relationship with someone, what is that? Your family karma, the environment you were born to, what kind of karma is that? And your group karma, the various types of larger human groups where you belong, what kind of karma is that? And please do not think of karma as destiny or something you must go through. Think of karma as something that you speak, you think, you feel, and you act, besides what you see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. So karma does not exist by itself. We make that happen by all these channels that I have just mentioned. And if you go through 180, you see that all this karma has the same substance. Originally, they do not exist. It is created by ourselves, by our minds. And as you progress beyond 180, you realize you can transform any kind of karma into another one, if you so wish or if you have to. You can forgive even the most heinous crimes. You can generate or create those things that you really need and you may help others with that. So the relativity of karma becomes clear at 180 and when you get to 270 degrees, you are skilled enough, experienced enough to transform any kind of karma into something else. No more hindrances, no more fear, no more absolute views. And you realize no matter how great magician you might be at 270, if you just do that for yourself, then your work is not done, it's not complete. And that's when you start to act for all beings. Do this for others. Help your family, help your partner, and help your group wherever you are. Using your attainment at 180 degrees, you can see your karma of past, present, and future. And you don't worry about the future and you do not deny the past. But you can also see that the only thing we really have is this moment. This is the moment where all karmas of past, present, and future unite. What you have done before results in this moment. What you are doing right now results in your future karma. In fact, it is our human mind that creates the notion of linear and cyclical time and three-dimensional space. Most of you have experiences that are not bound to the body and to the conceptual mind. And because of that, you know that we have extended frequencies beyond the sensual realm. And that becomes clear at 270 degrees. But if you want to handle them, you have to attain 180. If you do not attain no name, no form, no life, no death, no coming, no going, then some kind of karma will always control you because you have not stopped the identification. You have not cut off the attachment. You have not dissolved all illusions. That's why 180, this point, is so important. Many people from studies, they want to jump from 90 to 270 and bypass the hard part, not to go up to the mountain top, just, you know, come back like 70% and then cut through. We're done. I'm already happy. I know enough. I can transform my life. There is still leftover I. There is still leftover karma. And that can poison you later. So if you see suffering in your life, then something remained undone. If you see you're making mistakes, if you see you're vulnerable, if you see that you're not at peace, something was left undone. And that's why we need to practice. 
At 360 degrees, you are a selfless but very functional and actually very happy human being because you realize that if you help this world, you help yourself. And other human beings' happiness is your happiness. And at 360 degrees, it's not just that the sky is blue and the trees are green, but one more step, if you're hungry, I give you food, and if you're thirsty, I give you drink. This is an important point because if we are not clear, if our minds do not function clearly like space, clearly like a mirror, then I give you food when you are thirsty, and I give you drink when you're hungry. And that's why there's a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Why is that? Wouldn't it be just automatic that if you are a well-intended person with a lot of goodwill, then that brings you heaven, that brings you nirvana, that brings you enlightenment. The savage truth is that it is not enough. You have to be clear. Your mind has to be unmoving and it has to perceive the world and yourself and the other people as they are. And if you, if you find that you're suffering and inadvertently maybe you make others suffer, then some kind of clarity is missing and the mirror has a blind spot. Like in somebody's bathroom where the mirror is not regularly cleaned, there are spots of shaving foam and soap and shampoo, whatever, on the mirror. Maybe even a nice message from your significant other with a red lipstick, I love you. This message is wonderful, but wherever the mirror is covered, that's where it does not reflect. So that's why we teach clarity and non-attachment. Hence, you attain your substance. After that, you perceive truth. And then you can perform correct function or action. That can be our path. No human being has done that in a linear, step-by-step -step fashion. Mostly we jump. We jump from here and there. And we want to experience everything all at the same time. And then we realize that we are not robots. We are not going from one, two, three, four, five, six, just in a linear order. But we attain what we are interested in. Curiosity and free will is your determination. Do what you really believe you have to do, but don't stop there. And then sooner or later you cover all segments of the Zen circle, and then you become complete. No matter what kind of religion you have, what kind of outside job you have, what kind of worldview you have, you can adapt the Zen Circle's dynamics to that. So if you're a Christian believer, at 180 degrees you attain true God, not the image God, not the God that would have many names, but true God that whose face cannot be seen and whose names are not to be uttered. If you're a Sufi mystic, you do the same thing from an Islamic angle. And if you are following the Kabbalah as a Jewish person, then you attain something that even I don't know about because I'm not averse at Kabbalah. However, if you go to the Oriental you know, sphere, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, they did not work with one central entity. They worked with human mind and minds. And Buddhism and Taoism both taught our path. And the Zen circle is a wonderful model for that. So feel free to work with it creatively. Do not just take it for granted. You have the raw material to work with. Make it your own. Use it and then offer the benefits to others. The second chart is about mind only and karma. And there you can see eight levels of consciousness. And now, from our path, we turn to who we are. And of course, it includes some of our migrations, how we fare lifetime after lifetime. But you see actually a very interesting chart with the five physical senses, their sensory data, and the consciousness that they create. So we have eyes, we see colors and forms, and we have visual consciousness that can say the sky is blue and the carpet is gray. We have ears 
that can hear sounds, and we say, we hear the aircon. We have touch. Our skin has feelings wonderfully. So I touch here, this rostrum, and it's like a floor tile. So we have touch consciousness. So the physical senses are actually very, very clear. It's like our hardware. It's like a car to a driver. The sixth is the brain. That's where we form concepts. And that's why when we are asleep, our conceptual thinking is resting. Our senses are on standby. But the rest, the seventh and the eighth, they are active, mostly. The sixth consciousness is the concept forming, the analytical, the logical. That's where the term in English, Zen stick, is attached to this object. If I gave a Hungarian talk, I would use Zen bot. That's what it means. In Russia, we would say palica, okay? But this object doesn't say in Sarasota, hey, I'm a Zen stick, and travel a few thousand miles in Russia, it would say, ya palica. But it doesn't say that. It has no thinking, it has no mind of its own. The names that we use for any object, any phenomenon exists by our mental imputation or mental creation, okay? It's so spontaneous, and since we learn it from childhood with our native tongue, we don't notice it. But it's there. If you learn another language, or you have to recreate your own capabilities after some trauma or accident, you know how it works. The seventh is your discriminating consciousness. That's where the stick becomes long or short. That's where your day becomes good or bad. That's when you like or dislike your dinner. That's where dirty and clean are distinguished. When the seventh functions correctly, we have distinctions. We need them. Otherwise, we couldn't exist. We wouldn't look at ourselves as an entity. We couldn't take responsibility and we could not attain freedom. If it's over-functioning, if it's in an overdrive, we go into judgments. And we want our projections to be real. And the judgments, you know how, how they work. They split the world into the absolute notions of good and bad, and also people. And judgments can lead to a lot of qualities that cause suffering on this earth. That's why the non-judgmental mind is really important, but correct distinctions are necessary. If the distinguishing faculty is disabled, then uh, you drink your own bathing water, because you don't see what is clean and what is dirty. And that's a problem, too. Whatever you label with your seventh consciousness becomes your identity. I like this, I don't like that. Okay? So you store it in the eighth consciousness, which is your alaya, which is your long-term memory. It's like a huge warehouse. The seventh is the customer. I want this because I like this. I don't want that because I don't like that. What is most important that your notion of self, your ego, is formed by the seventh with the help of the other seven layers of consciousness. It's very important. Your sense of self is using your conceptual mind, the sixth, the five physical senses, and your memory to reconstitute your ego all the time. That's why and that's how you run narrative 24-7, okay? There are, of course, some breaks. One is when you sleep. The other is when you meditate. The other is when you are dead. These are very different states of mind. When you sleep, your first five physical senses are on standby. The sixth is resting because your brain is using the fluids that you actually drank and ate previously. But the seventh and the eighth are active, whether you stay inside the body or not. And that's why you see images. And that's why you move, your vision moves during your dreams. 
And whatever you haven't processed in your daily life, in the sensory realm, you have to vent it during your dreams. If you don't, you get sick, you get tired, you get exhausted, and some people get insane. That's the effect of sleep deprivation, when you cannot dream, because they make you stay in the body and alert and awake. When you meditate, you are awake. Your physical senses are on standby, but in a different mode than sleeping. The conceptual mind is switched off by the mind practice that you are doing. You're not consciously thinking. Therefore, you perceive the function of the seventh and the eighth as if you were looking at it from a mirror. And by now, you may have concluded that your true nature, your Buddha nature, your divine spark is not part of the eight levels of consciousness, but perceives all of them. And if you look deeper, it operates all of them. If you meditate, you can get to a point where you see the mind's perception and creation at one and the same point. This is a level of attainment. Where you can see and create at the same time. So when you meditate, your mirror mind perceives all the eight. And then you can remove your notion of self, your identification, your illusion from any part of your memory. It's there, you will remember it. But the polarity, the extreme good and the extreme bad will be gone. And that's how you can integrate your past, present and future into this moment. That's how your fears are removed. That's how your bad and good experiences stop being isolated. And the reintegration of the self is unimaginable without mental clarity. Because when you are clear mentally, and you perceive this moment and your karma, you activate the self-cleansing capability of the mind, and to some extent, the self-healing capability of the body. If you're attached to the karma, you get sick. If you become free from your karma, you get healthy. I'm simplifying it, but you can do the fine-tuning yourself. When you die, the first six stops functioning because they depend on your physical body. Without a brain, you cannot think. Without eyes, you cannot see. Without ears, you cannot hear. And that's when the seventh and the eighth, together, in our parlance, your soul, leaves the body, goes through the various stages of the death experience, and when the time comes, is reborn into a new body, another time, another environment, another family, from before. So the content of your memory, what you carry in your soul, and your preferences and notion of self, the seventh, together, they are like vectors pointing to your next birth. So if you wonder what kind of karma you had before, look at yourself right now. Because that past karma brought you right here. Look back to your childhood. That's why you were born to your own parents and not to the neighbors. To your own country and place of birth, not to the neighboring country. So nothing is by accident, but everything is relative and created as a phenomenon. Remember that. Because then you are not deterministic, but you also do not pretend to be free without responsibility. As we say, cause and effect are clear. Do we see that? That is the question. Also, on this chart, you can see the six realms of existence. Because by the content of our minds, now you know the seventh and the eighth consciousness, we can get to not just the human body, but we can get to animal body, or below the two other realms of demons and hell beings, and above human to the demigods and gods. And uh, personally, when I first read that, I thought it was a fairy tale. A nice Buddhist Mahayana Zen fairy tale. And I do not expect any of you to think more than that about this part of the chart. But if your meditation experience somehow confirms that we have some extended frequencies beyond the senses, that we can get to other realms with our minds than humans, 
in fact, we can connect to other beings than humans throughout our minds, then you may be having an extended view or an expanded sense of what I'm talking about. In Zen, your own experience convinces you, not me, not somebody else's words, not the sutras, not some Buddhist user's manual. The words can only point to the experience, but you have to have the experience yourself. I'm not asking to believe what I say. What I offer is that you can explore this. Because for the last 2,500 years, those people who have been working in this industry, they checked everything to the last dot again and again and again. That's why you can trust valid traditions. This is not somebody's idea from the past five to ten years. This has been handed down by the patriarchs for two and a half millennia. And if there was any mistake in it, we would have found it. So the six realms of existence are all subject to birth and death coming and going. All the six realms have a body and a mind. But when you attain enlightenment, then you can go beyond the six realms of existence or becoming and attain what we call the four heavenly realms of the listeners, the Shravakas, the Pratyeka Buddhas, attaining enlightenment with your own effort, the Bodhisattvas who return to help other beings after they get enlightenment, and the Buddhas, who are fully enlightened and they do not have to be born again. These together, the six and the four, are the ten directions. If you read Buddhist texts, that is the ten directions or the ten realms. What is the difference really between the upper four and the lower six? I like to refer to the upper four as the four most important aspect of your practice. First, listen. Listen, and everybody is listening now very well. I can see it in your eyes, in your intelligent eye gaze, that you are processing what I'm saying. You're listening. Wonderful. Next, make an effort. I'm pretty sure that everybody sitting in this wonderful church hall is making some kind of effort, whether it's meditation, contemplation, prayer, or otherwise, to attain something higher than you are right now. To make a better person out of yourself before you die. It's impossible to attain personal liberation without helping others. Imagine you have the perfect Lakeview beachfront apartment and somebody else is suffering crashes your door and something is incomplete. If you don't help another person, if you don't help this world, if you don't help other beings, their suffering will be our destruction. And you know it, especially in this part of the world. And of course, the fourth most important aspect is enlightened mind itself, the Buddha mind itself, because without that, all this loses meaning. All this has no focus point. So these are the four aspects, which of course, in Indian, Chinese, and Korean worldview, they expanded into four distinct realms so that we would not forget them. We would not confuse them. We would always mention them together. And what separates the four from the six is the threshold of life and death. Above that threshold, you choose. Below that threshold, your karma chooses for you. Below this level of emancipation and enlightenment, in the six realms, there is always some leftover karma that binds you, that determines your path because you are not, let, not yet fully enlightened. You haven't mastered the four important qualities that I have just laid out. When you do, your return here is by choice. If you don't, your return here is by constraints, by previous attachments. If you have a choice, your life seems to be a path. If you don't have a choice, your life seems to be just destiny a series of bad accidents down the road. It's our task to make a path out of our destiny. We can do that. That's why I have briefly spoken about the Zen circle as a model for our practice, the structure of body and soul and our true nature or spirit that can operate this very well. 
And I hope that this introduction has made sense, that it has been useful for you. And I would like to humbly invite your questions about the subjects that I have mentioned. I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not, but I don't know what EQ is. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is very important, not just in a relationship, in the world too. Sometimes feel with your heart first and then listen to the other person's speech. Then you can see whether he or she means what is being said or not. Okay? The IQ many times cannot decide that because we are too intellectual. The EQ feels something's wrong or something's very right. Okay? More questions? I've been trying to pay attention. <laughs> um, but the four births, the womb, egg, moisture, and transformation, did you cover that? Did you say what that No, was? I did not. I left oh. it for you to ask. Oh, good. <laughs> then now I'd like to know. I was sure somebody would be sharp enough to mention that. Congratulations. <laughs> so, the womb is pretty clear because we have human beings and animals that do that regularly. Moisture, look at the mushrooms. And eggs, hello birds. The transformation is very interesting. Transformation is something when you do not have a physical body, just an energy body, it transforms into something else than human. That means you either go up or down, because demons and gods, they do not have physical body. So being born into a physical body is not good, not bad, but it acts like a toolbox. If you need a size 18 wrench, for a nut and a bolt, later on, if you want to change that, loosen it or tighten it, you will need that size 18 wrench again. You make some karma with the human body, with eyes, ears, nose, tongue, intellect, memory, speech, feelings. You want to change that, you need that toolbox again. You have to be born into a human body again. Now, there are transformations where there is no new rebirth right away. And there is some kind of paid holiday in the higher realms, or some retribution in the lower realms. And when that karma is finished, then being reborn into a more favorable, like, physical body, where you can actually act, where you have some individuality, then it's possible again. I wanted to ask you about karma for the next life. And isn't it possible at the moment of death? Is it, is it what's in your mind at the moment of death that has some bearing on how you're reborn? When was the last time you visited a shopping mall? Um, probably yesterday. Great. <laughs> Did you do your shopping at the entrance? No. No. Did you carry the goods home with your car? Yes. Did you do the shopping inside the shopping mall, maybe in various outlets? Okay, so that's why the moment of death is not so important. It's not? No, because you go from one place to another, one building to another, one body to another, but you acquire your karma before, during your conscious life here, and you carry it to your next lifetime, that is your storage at home. So you pass that very important gate Getting out of the body is the point of no return. It's not a dream. It's not something you wake up from and, oh, I'm back. Let's have coffee. No. It's death. You're done. Body becomes dysfunctional. Kansas is going bye-bye. But your karma which you have made before is important just like the shopping bags you're carrying from the inside of the mall to your car. How you pass that gate is up to you. Some people crash through the glass. Some people understand that it's a revolving door. Be patient. There are other people before you. Just line up and you get through the revolving door. Some people say, ah, oh, it's automatic. Okay. Opens. I go. Closes behind me. But the problem is we don't understand death. We don't. Primarily because we don't understand life. So life is body and mind together. Chauffeur in the car, buckle up, drive. That's life. When you die, the mind gets out of the body and cannot return. 
undo your seat belt, get out of the car and see it as it's carried to the junkyard. And it's compressed into this three by three cubic feet little something which goes to the junkyard. So when you see that body and mind together is life, and mind without a body is the death state, then you will stop being afraid of it. We identify pain and suffering and death. We put a serious overlap note, but they are separate. You have pain at the dentist sometimes, but you know it's not suffering because the dentist is fixing you. Sometimes you have this unspoken suffering in your loneliness. Nobody hurt your senses, nobody is causing you pain, but loneliness is the killer and it doesn't hurt you physically, just suffering, 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 and you don't know what to do with it. And death is none of these two. You leave and you don't come back. So it's important to see what life is in order to appreciate it and use it correctly. And then we should also see that death is just a gate we go through and the soul's path continues. How? Depending on the, on the karma that you made before. So don't worry about your death. Watch out now. Watch out for this moment. What kind of speech? What kind of thinking? What kind of feelings? What kind of actions? And what kind of identification? Right now, what is it you identify with? What is it you disengage from? What kind of self do you create right now? What kind of soul do you assemble right now? When the Buddha taught non-self or anatta, it had many meanings. One very important part is that no karma is permanent, perfect, or independent. Therefore, every karma is imperfect, impermanent, and interdependent. Therefore, no part of your soul is beyond change or alteration or imperfection. That means you can change yourself. There is no thought that would be permanent, that would not be interdependent. There is no emotion that would not be impermanent. Any part, any content of your mind can change. So use your time in this body to create correct karma, to go beyond suffering, to attain awakening and help all beings. Because that defines your path. That defines your next lifetime. Okay? So the revolving door did not determine your shopping experience within the mall, but you carry it home what you got. Watch out what you shop for, because eventually it ends up in your garage. So meditation then is what does, is that going to do then to, uh, it, it's an awareness, right? It's sitting and being aware of how your mind is working. Is this it? It's a good starting point. And so, um, <sighs> supposing you haven't done that and you, you want to do it and you, you can't do it for very long periods, is there still some merit in doing it maybe even for five, ten minutes a day, and will that help karma? It will help you. It will only If you help do it me. for five, ten minutes, maybe it's not enough. Maybe if you are the embodiment of Kwan Sam Bosal herself, the Bodhisattva of compassion, then it's enough. Because your mind is so prepared, and so compassionate, and so wise, and so selfless. Then maybe five, ten minutes is enough. But you should see it for yourself. You meditate, and then meditation has a cleansing effect on your mind, as I have said. After that, what do you carry in your heart? What do you carry in your soul? And you, we see our next step. We see the homework that we haven't finished. I'm not saying whether five, ten minutes is enough. I just know that the more you practice and the deeper you go, the more you see it necessary to continue. But how many minutes a day? Your point, your decision. It's, it's a lame, it, as a layman. Even you, more you than would, monk, you, necessary. More than, yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I just wanted to ask you to expand a bit more on the word soul and attaching the word my soul and my rebirth or your rebirth to it. If you're thinking your mind and my mind are separate, 
If you cut off thinking, your mind, all human beings' mind become one. So the soul has no fixed attributes, fixed entity. We make that. The environment also makes that when we are children. So we bring some karma with us, which determines our birth and environment and parents. And that environment conditions us into the human being we originally wanted to be and had to be at the same time. So the soul is really the seventh and the eighth consciousness together. All your memories, who you think you are, all your distinctions and preferences together. Normally, you say, I. That's me. But if you go deeper and you remove the label, you can see a bunch of stuff under the hood, okay? So everybody's car has a brand name. One word, maybe two words. But if you open the hood, you see, wow, it's an engine. Whoa, this is a V8. Oh my gosh, you know? Then you see all in the V8, the eight levels of consciousness, okay? It's a huge soul, 5.6 liters. So you have a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions, a lot of ideas of past, present, and future. And everything that you store with the label of good and bad. You have seen trees, especially when they're cut. You can see the center, which is the earliest part. It's where the first root appeared. And then as the tree became a sapling and it got older, all these rings, every year, a dark and a light ring accumulated. That's our identity layers our identification. The Buddha called it mutual interdependence. So these layers depend on each other. You like this, then you don't like that. You're attracted to this, then you are repulsed by that. So that's our soul. And we believe it's permanent, that there's a permanent part, especially the I is the permanent part. And it turns out that the notion of I is illusory and there is no permanent part in your soul, but it exists. It's there. It's you. It's an entity. But don't think that it's permanent. Don't think it has a fixed name or a label. And don't think that any part of it is beyond change. That's a pretty big shift in our focus. My question is, what is Zen meditation to you? And are you going to teach it to us tonight? Yes, I'm teaching you right now and everyone what is Zen meditation. What are you doing right now? Absorbing. Listening? What you are doing right now, consciously, that awareness, that perception is meditation. What do you see now? What do you hear now? That consciousness, that awareness is Zen meditation. So if you want to have the gist of it, then there's a saying. Whether you are sitting, standing, walking, lying down, speaking in silence, in action or at rest, Constantly, without interruption, keep the question, what is this? What is this that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, thinks with my mind, feels with my heart, speaks through the mouth? What is this? Now, when you ask this question, then you are in the very center of Zen meditation. In uh, Korean, it's called Hua Du, which means the root of all phenomena, because the root of all phenomena is this original mind that creates the whole thing, the whole experience of being alive and later dead. The whole experience of being on this earth, associated with other human beings, finding a job, finding a mission, finding friends and enemies. This is all created by mind alone and finding, attaining that mind, that Zen. And traditionally, the quote unquote theory, which is not theory, the practice, which is not just something mechanical, they are not separate. But we teach them on two separate occasions because of the practical arrangements and also because if your mind does not like what you hear, you're not coming for the meditative experience and nobody expects you to. So I'm wondering, and I struggle with this notion of the word attaining because my training has been no grasping and no averting and avoiding. So when I hear the word attain, it sounds synonymous with grasping. Can you talk about that? Sure, everybody understands water. It's H2O in a liquid form. In Hungarian, it's called Vs. In German, Wasser. In French, L'eau. 
That's when you think about it, you cognize about it, you form concepts about it in various languages. That's when you study water if you're a chemist or a physicist. But if you want to attain water, then you drink. In fact, I would like to attain water. Do we have some? Please. I'm thirsty. So if I want to attain water, I drink. Similarly, with life, you have to experience it, attain it, and the essence of our human nature is, again, something to be attained. Now, there's something really interesting about that. If you read the Heart Sutra, the heart of the wisdom, the transcendental wisdom, then it says that in the state of this attainment, there is no eyes, no ears, no tongue, no body, no mind, no realm of eyes, no past, no present, no future, no suffering, no cause, no liberation, no attainment. So this is a spiritual path where you get to attainment is no attainment. That's when all the bubbles are popped, all the illusions are gone. Yet, the central concept of Zen is attainment with nothing to attain. So without anything sensory or mental, still you attain our true nature. It's not your own, it's ours. So attainment is direct experience, let's leave it at that. But I really had to make it clear for you that this kind of attainment that we speak about is not grasping, not attachment. In fact, it's the di diametric opposite. It's not identification, all right? If you do not identify with anything, you attain your true self. Thank you, sir. More questions about attainment? Oh, back there. I have a question about uh, uh, experiencing multiple dimensions of self. And Say it again, please, louder. Bringing uh, multiple dimensions of self to the fourth and living with it. Uh, my experience is sometimes that that witness of dimensions, of uh, different points of view of dimensions of being, sort of become very fluid at this point in my life. It's hard to explain. I'm trying to to not feel so much a pull in one dimension and another dimension of being, but just try to be sort of detached from all those witnesses and points of dimensional views. I don't know if that's, um, that's where it's going, and I don't know if there is a, some teaching regarding this. Yeah, let me ask you, where do those dimensions come from? The all, the, the myself. Yourself? What are you? Where do you store those dimensions? I mean, last time I checked my passport, there were no extra dimensions there. Where do you have yours? Um, and just uh, in my daily life? No, right All there. there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you say it's created by your thinking, I believe you. Right. If you say that you enter them, I also believe you. But how mm -hmm. to handle those dimensions, that's our job. Right. Whoever creates that, whether it's you or someone else, we're a group of beings. It doesn't right. matter. Do not lose the moment. Right. You have the moment. You see clearly right now. Hear clearly right now. Think, act, and feel clearly right now. You have the moment. Mm -hmm. You lose the moment, you lose everything. Right. So, in our normal daily life, we have three dimensions in space and one dimension in time. Because you cannot reverse it. This one dimension, this just monolinear continuum, whether it spins or just progresses, it's irreversible. At first, we are totally shocked by that when we realize we're going to die. But remember, if you could turn it back, it would be such a mess. In a nanosecond, the universe would become inoperable, totally. We would be unable to come and go. Right. Because we could always go back to grandma and ask for a better version of our own mother. We don't want that, okay? Right. So, in our the normal daily existence, we have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. Because this is our normal habitual thinking. In a dream state, it's already different. Right. An out-of-body experience, very different. Some people load themselves with some chemistry, don't. It's also becoming very different because it shows the effect of our brain, okay? Mm-hmm. 
So moment to moment, keep it clear, no matter how many dimensions you experience, because this, which I have just you know, laid out as the what is this question, it has an extension, whether you are in the body, outside of the body, alive or dead, dreaming or awake. Constantly, without interruption, what is this? That means right. you stay in the moment, you stay clear, and you know your path, you walk your path. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they seem to always connect when that you do that. They seem to just be all together in some strange way. So, okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. How much of our lives are created by karma versus our mental minds? What does your mind create? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm wondering. How much is it influenced by that? I think you are using karma in the sense of destiny. That's what I'm gathering from your question. Because there is nothing which is created but wouldn't be karma. We all need to understand karma is just cause and effect, action and result. Well, and then the accumulation of that into habits, the identification with those habits, the formation of the self out of those habits, the formation of a family or, or the community out of the self, because karma doesn't stop in the individual. We have group karma, as I have mentioned. So everything is karma. That's the good news. Mind is creating it, even better news. And you can stop your mind from creating karma. That's the best news. So I mean, if I'm bringing, um, am I bringing this karma from my past lives over here, and I have to f play that out, how, how much is that influencing my life? You are bringing it with you, but you don't have to play it out. Well, how do I stop it? You see it first, and you make a decision. Have you ever been upset with your boyfriend? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you always play it out? Come on. Yeah, I'm playing it out right oh, now. Oh, poor him. I would really not want to be in his shoes. Must be very, very fierce. Right now, like so, stop it. When you come back to this point, you can stop it. No karma here. Very important that you see it first, perceive cause and effect first, and then you make a decision. Do I want to say this or not? Yeah, do I want to do this or not? Because I don't want the result. So then you stop yourself. You hold it back. Don't suppress it, ladies and gentlemen. We don't, otherwise you go to Freudian therapy. We don't want that. Neither suppressing it, nor playing it out, or giving way to it. So if you suppress it, it takes a tour in your subconscious, comes back with a vengeance. If you vent it, you just let it happen, you know it for yourself. So be careful with what you think, what you feel, what you say, and what you do. And by now, everybody understands that you cannot just mobilize your own personal police force inside. If you one part of your mind is policing the other, bad choice. Perceive. Perceive cause and effect, like you would perceive in the mirror. You go into your bathroom, you see your, your face in the mirror, say, no, 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 I don't want this face. I want a different face. How can you do that? You have your face. Now you can actually ask a deeper question. How did my face become like this? So then you can see your face became like this because you see, think, feel, taste, act, say those things that you do. That's what made you into the being that you are. Then you can change your karma and be careful, OK? Life changes. We change. And then sometimes partnerships seem very disposable. And then we always believe we can get another one. Then time runs out. More questions? Hi. Um, one of the, I think, most difficult um, concepts in Buddhism is the one of emptiness. Could you tell us in a few words? I know probably. Yeah, not it's one of the mistranslations we have. So Getting back to the original concept is shunyata in Sanskrit, which means complete emptiness or empty completeness. The two together in one Sanskrit word. No scholar could really translate that with one morpheme. It's not possible. 
So the most common misconception in the West that emptiness is nothingness. It's not something substantial, like a mold out of which you can create many objects, but it's like void. And you can see many wonderful scholarly works where it's translated as void, nothingness, and people become nihilistic. And it's a very big mistake. I give you some wonderful example how not to fall into emptiness, right? Everybody knows Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie the Pooh visits Rabbit. And Rabbit knows that uh, Pooh's visit is a total disaster in terms of milk and honey. So Pooh knocks at the door and says, hello, is there anybody home? And Rabbit says, no, nobody. First line of defense, nobody. Then Pooh, he doesn't have a Pentium 4, you know, he's slow. But he really thinks, and he says, hmm, nobody cannot say nobody. There must be somebody to say nobody. Okay? So, where is Rabbit? Then Rabbit has to give up and say, Rabbit went to see her friend Winnie the Pooh. And Pooh says, but that's me. So that must be you, Rabbit. Open up, open up. And of course, then Sunday morning happens, you know the rest. So remember, nothing cannot say nothing. And that's where the whole conceptual and speculative problem ends. That's why in Zen we say don't know. Don't know is before thinking before something or nothing appears, before emptiness or completeness appear. Very important point. So you come back before thinking, you attain, don't know. That attainment is key. It's a non-conceptual mind. And if you were with me in the last two minutes, you can see how far we got from nihilism or from the concept of total voidness or vacuum. It's a misconception, and we should remember that all those very artist translators who, like if two, three hundred years ago, started to translate Buddhist texts, and about 150 years ago in earnest, London Buddhist Text Society, okay, end of 19th century, they were not practitioners, they were scholars. And they translated the words, but they did not know the meaning. How could they have known it? They have never spent enough time attaining that, and out of that attainment, forming the right conceptual framework. So when you see practitioners translating spiritual works, it sounds very different from just a scholarly translation, all right? So we can just check that off. I was going to ask, how can I have more self-compassion and uh, for a healthier tomorrow, but I think you referred to emptiness. <laughs> so you think emptiness helps you being more compassionate? How? Just clearing everything out? Yeah, that's a garage sale. Then what? <laughs> <laughs> then what? Not bad. Be with me. Make the next couple of steps. You'll be there. Emptiness, compassion, how do they relate? Uh, well, finding that love and, and joy through... Not right away. So let me fill in the intermediary steps. If your mind is void of self, you and the other person's mind become one. This oneness experience is a complete mirroring. You perceive, you feel what the other person really needs. It's not what they want, it's not what they say, it's what they really need. You perceive that, they trust you. This trust comes from this intuitive perception that they also feel that you understand them better than anyone else. You perceive them better than anyone else. And that is the root of compassion. Compassion can be sometimes very tough, even wordless, just doing some kind of action together. And sometimes it's also manifesting in emotions. But please understand that compassion is not an emotional posture. Otherwise, we would exhaust ourselves very quickly. 
Compassion is rooted in the oneness experience with an other being's mind. That's why you cannot be compassionate towards yourself. It's a contradiction in terms. There's only one self of yours. You divide that, oneness is gone. Some people congratulate themselves. What is that supposed to mean? They love themselves, they feel compassion towards themselves, so version A of myself is feeling compassion towards version B of myself? Look at it. So it's a very, very good question. Clean out the notions of self, become one with the environment, mm -hmm. then you feel compassion even to the last lizard in your courtyard. Adequately. Not more, not less than the lizard needs. They don't need much. Okay. <laughs> Just don't run over them with your car. <clears throat> more questions? If I understood you correctly, after we die, the thinking mind and the the storehouse uh, consciousness still exists and it's moving to the next. The distinguishing mind, but the conceptual thinking is gone. You cannot form new concepts in the state of death or dying. So one to six, to the garbage, seven and eight, group together, that's your soul, goes on. So, and you have your memory stored in seven and eight? Yes, that is correct. The main storage is the eighth. The seventh is polarizing it into good memory, bad memory. I like it, I don't like it. So when it transforms to another body, how come? It enters another body, enters? if it's a physical body, and transforms into a different mental body if it chooses to do so. What about all the memories, the past memories? You have them, and most of them become subconscious. When we are born, let's say, let's stick with the human incarnation. It's very interesting. Human being is wonderful. Okay, I would ask for an upgrade, but human being 2.0 hasn't arrived yet. So let's stick with, with what we have. When we arrive into this new body, we cry, we poop, we suck some milk, and we sleep. Not much else. Because the mind is not active yet, we just arrived, okay? And as we get our stimuli from the environment, as our, we are being caressed and fed and cared for over months and years, these stimuli activate our consciousness, activate everything. Step by step, year by year, our subconscious begins to manifest for good reasons. Can you imagine that a three-year-old would have to endure the karma of a 24-year-old? We wouldn't be able to do that, we would break. So just like I've said before with the tree rings, all our past identities, past life identities are the, like the rings of the tree. And as we are born, we go through them. And when we arrive at the bark, the tree bark, that's our current sensory existence and connection to the world. So it's a gradual activation. And that's why nature and nurture are so important, because by education, we can change that karma. Look at it. Look at various family lives, various echelons of society, what a huge difference it makes to have proper family environment, to have good education. The karmic activation and passivation or suppression, it makes a huge difference. What kind of switches are turned on in your consciousness and what kind of switches are turned off? That's all education and conditioning and giving you a new sense of who you are. That's how the seventh and the eighth use one to six. And that's how the chauffeur gets into the new car. And we want to drive and we remember all the past destinations. And we want to go to the same shopping mall again, the same restaurant again, the same spouse, the same family that we perceived as good, that gave us happiness, fulfillment. Whatever positive we have, we want to get it. Whatever negative we've got, we want to leave that behind. That's the seventh job. And the storehouse, number eight, is just having everything, everything that the seventh labeled as positive or negative, me or not me. That's how we work. That's how we operate. And most of this is in our subconscious, 95%. 5% is your conscious personality, all right? And if you meditate, then this threshold becomes 
transparent. It doesn't disappear. Don't think like that. Can you imagine that all your subconscious content is getting just pushed into this moment? We would go crazy. Some people actually do. There are doors, up and down. When you want to remember something spontaneously, you remember, you use it as long as necessary, then trap door opens backwards, goes back to your subconscious. So it's transparent and flexible, spontaneous or contextual memory and spontaneous and contextual forgetting. Don't worry about forgetting. You need to forget. Okay? So when you meditate, your memory distinctions and the other six levels of consciousness become very spontaneous and very clear. Your mind is not overwhelmed, but it's also not lacking anything. So the archetypes become cleaned up. That's why mantra practice is so important, ladies and gentlemen. And meditation is actually giving you insight. And then since you do not believe that your sense of self is absolute, it's relative. The thresholds can move. The doors of memory and the doors of forgetting, they can open and close. Depending on your situation and relationship, your mind functions spontaneously and clearly without thinking of good and bad, me and the other. So as I'm <laughs> listening to you tonight, as usual, I am in my own philosophy doing these continuous comparisons of the varying language being used in discipline and philosophy. And it's, it's just such a gift, so thank you for that. And I, and I have been sitting here wanting to relate and, and attain what it is that you're sharing. And I, and I get the sense that in some of what I was thinking that in meditation, at least in the perception that I have of it and the way that I utilize it, and I have sat in your workshop and will be there again tomorrow, that as I allow myself to surrender I become more of the observer of the participant that's occurring in my world. So I'm simultaneously able to have this view of myself doing what I do and an awareness of it simultaneously at the same time. And yet, independent from it enough to where it isn't governing what I'm doing, I'm seeing it for what is it. Sometimes you have to surrender the difference between the observer and the actor. Like I said earlier, when you perceive the creation and the result of it at the same time, so the seer and the doer become the same. Right. And I wish we would all have that. Then observation does not become a hindrance and action does not remain unobserved. Right. Remember that. Well, they dance <laughs> quite a bit, the two dancing of them. Dancing so. is good. That's why Shiva <laughs> is dancing. It's a yes, cosmic they... dance for the last couple of thousand years. Now, I hear also the release of struggle allows for clarity in what you're saying. Yeah. And in that release of struggle, it feels as if the term being surfaces for me repeatedly. Yeah, struggle in my book is unnecessary effort or something <laughs> cyclical that repeats itself for no reason. And that struggle can be relinquished. That can be surrendered. Is a struggle around false concepts? Is the checking mind, the making mind, the wanting mind, illusory attachment mind? And if we stop struggling, they all disappear. And we become clear. And so if we're releasing into what has been described as the emptiness, and as you mentioned, the emptiness being the completeness, yeah. Being completely aware in a moment of being while observing what is leaves us complete rather than empty in the sense that we're one with what is happening. Complete and empty at the same at time. The same time. All right. Digest that, everyone. <laughs> Digest that. That's where your thinking cannot go left or right. You say complete without emptiness. <clears throat> You say empty, no completeness, uh, not good. Come back to this don't know. Come back to no thinking. Then sky is blue, trees are green, and it's a Sarasota beautiful evening tonight. So awareness and, and observation is lack of what would be judgmental thinking. And then therefore, 
it creates the freedom for it you to be able to... It leaves the freedom as it is. Everything else is okay. Oh, leaves it the leaves the freedom. leaves the freedom as Thank it you. is. Yeah. You don't have to create it. It's right. already it is. there. Yes. You remove the judgments, you remove dualities, you remove illusions. It's there. It's like clouds are gone. Wow. It's always been there. Wonderful. Oh, so acceptance becomes a key Acceptance, in, in the moment. Acceptance, but it's not inaction. Sometimes uh, your dog poops on the floor. <laughs> you accept it, but you clean it up. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I know you have a dog. <laughs> Wonderful. More, more questions? Earlier you were talking about uh, time and... Um, you so you're born, you die, and we have to accept that. Yeah. Well, what is your concept of time? Do you co is, is your concept of time linear, or does it uh, is it like mishmash? My like concept of time is 8:35 p.m. Okay. But what about the timeline? No lines. No loops. So just now. 8:36. That's it. Any other concept is false. You're wonderful. You're smart. Your question is accurate. If I put just one conceptual truth into your mind, it becomes distorted. No concept of time. No linear, no cyclical. Everything is made by the moon phases, oof, okay, and linear as we see, but it's all created by our minds. The moon doesn't know about its own phases. We know it. The earth doesn't know about its own rotation. We do. So this human machine, this brain, interprets our being here as monolinear in time and with the cycles and the linearity together. So the only concept, which is a non-concept, it's 837. That's all I can give you as the truth, okay? Everything else is theory. Best two minutes I've ever spent, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? You just said Mantra yeah. is so important, but you can choose any mantra. Uh, yes, you can. Okay. But, but don't choose anything with a commercial content. No. Sometimes you get mantras in shopping malls. I, I, I heard them today. <laughs> buy me, buy me, buy me, buy me. So this is a mantra, okay? But you don't repeat that because your mind has adverse effects. So what you know about the mantras is important because it's meaning. Mantras have three kinds of effects. One, it's reducing your noise. You have so much noise in your mind because we live in an information age. We are loaded with zeros and ones, sensory perceptions, and it's just too much. That's it, neither good nor bad, too much. The mantra reduces this noise. Real mantras that are not coined phrases, they have transcendental meaning. The second effect, that the meaning becomes primary. It goes to the top of the food chain in your own mind. So we recite the mantra of enlightenment or compassion or wisdom. Whatever we recite, it goes as top priority in your consciousness. Second, the signal. First, no noise. Second, signal. And the third important effect is protecting your own mind against your own harmful influence. You can be your best friend you can be your worst enemy depending on your reactive consciousness. Originally, this world is not good, not bad, but we react to it. Our reaction makes it good or bad. Now watch out for that one. So the mantra stops this reactive mind, puts it into an infinite loop, and this loop is actually preserving your mental health. It's wonderful, instead of just wrecking your brain, destroying yourself emotionally, and putting yourself into a cognitive blind alley, just recite the mantra, keep your energy, let the signal shine, and let the noise disappear. We will be practicing that tomorrow. More questions? As I sat here this evening, you described two different terms that I would like to see, hear more clarity on simple terms of mind and soul. In some of your descriptions, there were conflicting ideas that I had about what I understand a soul to be and what you were describing and what I understand mind to be and its purpose and what you were describing. Briefly, okay. could you share a bit of what each of those are okay. and how that relates? 
to give you an idea how confusing this is, even in the Orient, mind with the lowercase m is your sixth consciousness. It's your intellect. Mind with a capital M is your true self. It's your true nature. Dharma is phenomenon with a lowercase d. If it's capital D, is the law that governs all phenomena in this universe. Okay? So in my vocab, I use mind with a lowercase m. And that is your sixth consciousness. It's your intellect. It's your Excel chart. It's your word processor. It's your PowerPoint presentation. That's your sixth consciousness. All right? And your true nature, your true self, our substance, the no name, no form, divine spark, that's the one that's beyond life and death, beyond good and bad, perceives everything, etc., etc. And I'm trying to use different morphemes for different spiritual concepts. That's why you hear me say this. The soul, when we are in the body, uses everything. Everything. The seventh and the eighth uses one, two, three, four, five, six. Because we see, we hear, we taste, we smell, we touch, we think, so that we could distinguish and have good and bad notions about it. So that we could remember and then make more memories, richer experiences. So the thirst for the soul to be born and use these levels of consciousness is called tanha in Sanskrit, the drive for experience. We want it. That's our precious. Okay? We want this experience. This individuality wants to be alive again and again and again so that we could see, hear, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, memorize, distinguish, talk, and act again and again and again. That's what the soul wants, as long as it is untrained. As long as we do not see the cyclical life and death of some sorry consciousness. And then you can make a decision that you don't want to be part of this anymore. You want to attain something higher than that. And then cause and effect begins to have different meaning for you. Sensory perceptions stop being so dualistic for you. You activate the self-cleansing capability of the mind by meditation practice. And then you attain something else than just the constant repetition of birth and death, having a body, having no body, etc., etc., etc. So that's how I'm trying to set up the conceptual framework. Thank you so very much. Thank that you. brought great clarity for me. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would like to sincerely appreciate your hospitality tonight, your eager minds, your wonderful clear listening, and your questions. And I hope that this lecture helped even very, very little on your own path becoming a better practitioner and a better human being. I also believe that if we practice our own faith and we attain the essence of our creed, then we can save all beings from suffering and make this world a better place to live for us and for future generations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.